Welcome back to our lecture series, Linear Algebra Done Openly. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In the previous section, 3.3, we discussed the idea of matrix inverses. When can we cancel out multiplication by a matrix? And we saw a formula for two by two matrices, how to compute the inverse, but for a general formula, we don't yet have. And so the primary goal of section 3.4 about elementary matrices is to accomplish exactly that, an algorithm for computing the inverse of a non-singular matrix. And we're gonna do this, develop the inversion algorithm using the technique of elementary matrices, which we're gonna define right now. An elementary matrix is a matrix obtained by performing a single row operation to the identity matrix. Remember the identity matrix, of course, is uh, the matrix with ones along the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. And so as there are three different types of elementary row operations, the replacement, the interchange, and the scaling operations, elementary matrices will come in one of three types in correspondence to those, matrix, or those operations. And we're gonna see that each and every one of the types is actually itself a non-singular matrix. The one we use the most often is replacement, so let's begin with that. A typical replacement operation looks like the following. We're gonna replace row i with row i plus c times row j, where c is some specific scalar in the field right here. So we're gonna to add to row i c times row j. What does this do to the identity matrix? Let's think of that for example. If we were to take, let's, let's use a specific example. Let's say we're gonna replace row three with row three plus, let's say, oh no, let's do minus two times row one. Now, if we were gonna take the standard, uh, we'll, we'll take a three by three matrix here. So think about the standard identity matrix, ones along the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. If we took, uh, if we took row three and we replaced it with row three minus two times row one, this would change the number in the uh, three one position. And that would actually make it a negative two uh, that we would see right there. Let's call this elementary matrix E1 for later reference here. And so this is what happens in general, that if you have an, if you have a, a replacement operation you're gonna do, you're gonna take the order we have right here, so the 3, 1, uh, this comes and affects the 3, 1 position. And in the 3, 1 position, you're going to put uh, this number here, the negative 2. So the negative 2 is going to go inside the 3, 1 position of the identity matrix. And so this gives us a typical replacement matrix. We were In the ij position, we put the number c, where i and j represent the row that we're adding together in that order. The order does matter here. Now, I claimed that this matrix is a non-singular matrix, and the inverse of this matrix is also going to be a row replacement. You're going to get ones along the diagonals, zeros everywhere else, except for the one number that was non-zero, which in this case was a negative two. You're going to replace it with the with its, well, it's with its negative. Negative two would become a positive two or positive two would become negative. Just switch the sign. And I claim these are gonna be inverse operations of each other. Let's see that real quickly. I'm gonna just scroll up a little bit so we have some blank spot here. But if we take one, zero, 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 one, zero, negative two, zero, one, and you multiply that by its proposed inverse, one, zero, 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 one, zero, Two, one, zero. Notice what happens here when you take the first row times it by the first column. You're going to hit a one, and then a bunch of zeros. You're going to ignore everything down here in the second row. In fact, so you're just going to get a one. Likewise, you're going to get a zero with the second column and a zero with the third column. So you end up getting one, zero, zero, like so. When you do the second row here. You're gonna the only thing that the only thing that has a chance of not being zero is whatever is in the second row of the second matrix there. And so you're gonna grab a zero, one, zero. Notice you're just gonna copy the matrix first row and second row, because that's what the identity matrix does. And then lastly, if you take the first row, or the third row times the first column, this time you're gonna end up with, well, you're gonna get a negative two plus two, 
which in that situation, you're going to end up with a zero. Negative two plus two. If you take the third row times the second column, uh, you end up with just a zero. Oh, why is there a one in that spot? That's, that's alarming. Try that again. This should be zero, one. So now when I do that calculation for real this time, you, 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 you get, do get a zero, right? You're going to get zero plus zero plus zero. And when you do the third column, you're going to get a one right there. So in fact, this does give us the identity matrix when we multiply these things together. So these things are inverses of each other like we proposed. So when you have a replacement matrix, you're going to put the off diagonal entry that corresponds to the rows that you're combining. The row, the call, uh, the row position is going to be the row you're adding to. The column position is going to be the row you're adding from. All right. When you want to find the inverse, you just have to switch the sign of the number. Negative 2 becomes positive 2 and positive 2 becomes negative 2. How about interchange? If we were doing an interchange row operation, that means we would be interchanging row i with row j. Now, if we did that to the identity matrix, let's again take a 3 by 3 identity as an example here. If we took the standard identity matrix... And let's interchange two rows. Let's say we wanted to interchange rows. We're going to interchange. And we'll do rows two and three. Rows two and three. If we did that, so we want to swap rows two and three, what's going to happen is the second row is now going to look like the first row, uh, the third row, excuse me. That's what it was, 0, 0, 1. And then the third row is going to turn into what the second row used to be, so 0, 1, 0. We're going to call this elementary matrix 2 for a moment. And so this is what we would see happening when you interchange rows uh, of the identity matrix. You're just going to swap the rows in question. Everyone else says the same, but those who got swapped will switch positions. So the location of the ones might look a little bit different. Now, what's curious, these, these interchange matrices are also non-singular. And what you get here is that the inverse of the interchange matrix is actually itself. And think about that. How do you undo interchanging rows? You just put them back the way you were. If 2 and 3 got swapped, then if you swap 2 and 3 again, they'll go back to the way they were. With replacements, how do you undo a replacement? If I took row 3 and I subtracted from it 2 times row 1, I can undo that process by adding back two times row one. So inverse operations there. And let's try to convince ourselves for these, for these interchange matrices. If I take the matrix and I square it, I claim I'm going to get back the original matrix. Uh, well, that is the identity matrix is what I meant to say. And so consider that. If you take the first row, first column, you're gonna get one. Second column, you're gonna get zero. Third column, you're going to get a zero. That looks like the identity so far. If you take the second column, sorry, second row, first column, you're going to get a zero. With the second column, you're going to get a one. And with the third column, you're going to get a zero. So you end up getting one, zero, zero. And then if you take the third row, first column, you're going to get a zero. The second column, you're going to get a zero. And the third column, you're going to get a one thus recapturing the identity matrix like we said it would. In, uh, interchange matrices are their own inverses. Pretty cool that way. Um, now the third row operation is scaling. So we're going to take a single row i and times it by some scalar c. And so let's start off with the identity matrix. Again, we'll just take 3 by 3 for an example here. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And let's say we want to scale, let's scale row two by the number seven. So if you scale the second row by seven, what this does is, well, when you time something by zero, it'll still be zero, but one times seven is gonna be seven. And so then what we see here for this third elementary matrix type is that if you're going to be doing, uh, if, you, if you're scaling row two, then you're going to replace the 2, 2 position with the 7, with the scalar that's in play right here. And that's how we get a scaling matrix. Just remove the corresponding row, the 1, replace it with whatever you scaled by. 
The inverse of this, because this is also a non-singular matrix, is easy enough. You're going to take 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, seventh, 0, 0, 0, 1. That is, you're going to take the reciprocal in the position that you're scaling by. And so to see that these are, in fact, inverses of each other, take 1, 0, 0, 0, 7, 0, 0, 0, 1, times that by the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, seventh, 0, 0, 0, 1, and go through the multiplication. First row, first column, that gives you a 1. Second column gives you a 0. Third column gives you a 0. So we get 1, 0, 0. Take the second row, this is going to be an interesting one, times it by the first column, you're going to get a 0. With the second column, you're actually going to get 7 sevenths, which is a 1. And then with the third column, you're going to get a 0. And then the last one, you take the third column, first row, you'll get a 0. Second column is a 0. Third column will give you a 1, uh, thus giving us the identity matrix again. So we've now talked about the three different types of elementary row operations. Why do we care about elementary row operations? Excuse me, elementary matrices. They correspond to elementary row operations. Well, it turns out that multiplying by an elementary matrix has an interesting effect to matrices. So let's let's just take a generic three by three matrix. We'll call it matrix A. Its entries are going to be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. All right, and let's multiply this generic three by three matrix by the three elementary matrices we had considered. Uh, so for example, let's take the matrix E1, which was 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, negative 2, 0, 1. And remember, this is the matrix that corresponded to the operation where we're going to replace row 3 with row 3 minus 2 times row 1. Remember, that was the operation that got this thing started. If we go through the multiplication here, we're going to take the first row times the first column. That'll grab us an A. The second column, that'll give us a B. The third column, that'll give us a C. Let's record this down. So we're going to get A, B, C. Notice we just copied down the first row of the matrix A, which might not be too surprising because the first row of E1 is the same first row as the identity matrix. The identity matrix, when you multiply it, you're going to get back the original matrix. So we copied down the first column, uh, the first row of A, excuse me. Well, let's see that same thing happen when we do the second row of E1. When you get the first column of A, you're going to get the letter D. The second column is going to give you the letter E. And the third column is going to give you the letter F. And so here, again, we're just going to copy down the second row unaffected because, after all, the second row right here is just identical to the second row of the identity matrix. The third row is when things get interesting. So in this situation, you're going to get a negative 2a plus 0d plus g. And so if we summarize what we had there, we're going to have a g minus 2 times a. I'm going to add a line here to keep some space clear. Uh, if we do the third row times the second column, you're going to get a negative 2b plus 0e plus 1h, which will look like h minus 2b. And then finally, if you take the third row times the third column, you're going to get negative 2c plus 0h plus 1i. And so in the end, you end up with an i minus 2 times c. And so examining that third row, you can see exactly what we, what's going on right here. The third row looks just like the original row 3, but we subtracted from a 2 times row 1. Multiplying by the matrix E1 performed the elementary row operation where we replaced row 3 with negative 2 times row 1. Multiplying by the elementary matrix performed the associated elementary row operation. Well, that's kind of interesting. What happens if we do the same thing for E2, where E2 was this interchange matrix? If we multiply by E2, let's see what happens here. You take the first row times the first column, you get an A. Second column gives you a B. Third column gives you a C which again, the first row of E2, just like an E1, it was identical to the first row of the identity matrix, so you shouldn't expect it to do anything. Well, what happens when we take the second row times A? With the second row, you're gonna get 0, 0, G. For the second column, you're gonna get 0, 0, H. And for the third column, you're gonna get 0, 0, I. So we end up getting the third row, G, H, I. The second row kind of disappeared there from A. If you multiply by the third row of E2, you're going to get a 0, D, 0 for the first column. The second column gives you 0, E, 0. 
And then the third column is going to give you 0F0, which we'll notice is actually the uh, second column, the second row of E, excuse me. So we ended up swapping the rows 2 and 3 inside of A. And remember, E2 corresponded to the interchange operation where we said we were going to interchange rows 2 and 3, was it? And so multiplying by this interchange matrix had that effect that it performed the associated row operation on the matrix, A. Now let's do the scaling here. We might be able to guess what's going to happen. Um, we Remember that E3 was the elementary matrix associated with row 2 is going to be scaled by a factor of 7. Right, so we scaled row 2 by 7. Well, what happens here? If you take the first row, you're going to get back an A, a B, and a C as you go through all the columns. So you get back the original row 1, A, B, C. And if I skip ahead and I do the third row, you're going to see the same thing. The first column will give you a G, the second column will give you an H, and the third column will give you an I. So we get G, H, I. Nothing happened there. But when you take the second row, right, this is the thing that's different from the identity, you're going to get 0A plus 7D plus 0G. That's going to give you a 7D. If we do the second row, third column, a second column, excuse me, you're going to get 0B plus 7E plus 0H, the third column. You'll get 0C plus 7F plus 0I. And so you see here that the product of these two matrices ends up just multiplying the second row by 7, which is exactly what this scaling matrix was supposed to do. And so then if we summarize what we saw in this previous example, we have the following. If an elementary row operation is performed on an M by N matrix A, the resulting matrix can be written as E times A. So there's a factorization associated to this, well, I mean, there's a matrix product, I should say. The resulting matrix E times A, where, where E is the M by M elementary matrix associated to this matrix. This is the same thing. So I guess what I'm saying is that when you row reduce a matrix by a single row operation, that's the same thing as multiplying by that elementary matrix. So multiplying by an elementary matrix does the exact same thing as row, re row reducing a matrix, or performing a row operation. And so what we're going to see here is that if A is row equivalent to a matrix, there's going to be an elementary matrix that actually gets you there. And so this factorization, uh, that is, we're, we're connecting row operations with matrix multiplication. And that's going to be the key to finding the inverse of a matrix, which we'll see in the next video.